Well, here we are again at the start of another section, another topic. This time we're going to be looking at World War I, and World War I is, from my experience, kind of a, um, I don't know, underrepresented, sort of less well-known event, um, partially because it gets obscured by World War II, which obviously there's no question how significant and impactful World War II was. But World War I is in many ways a really, really important event in American history because it fits neatly into some of the um, progressive era developments. It squeezes in right before and is directly connected to a lot of the 1920s. And so there's a lot going on during World War I, especially even though America's involvement is quite a bit more limited than, than that of others uh, in Europe, like Britain and Germany and France in particular, but nevertheless, it's really, really an important topic. Um, and so we're going to give, you know, some consideration to it. There's way more that we could do, just like there is with pretty much any of the topics that we do in the class. Um, we never really do them complete justice because there's so much density and, and depth into all of them that we could really um, pull out. But so World War I, as I said, for the American experience, it's quite a bit different from that of the rest of Europe. Um, it is definitely a global conflict, not to the scale of what we see in the Second World War, but definitely a significant kind of event in a lot of respects. So what is the First World War. How does it happen? Well, it's the result of a number of different factors. Um, the easiest one to talk about is the different alliances that are signed among different nations in Europe. The Central Powers, the Triple Alliance, from the American perspective, those are the bad guys. Um, initially, it is Germany, Italy, and then this huge polyglot empire of what's called Austria-Hungary. Austria-Hungary is, if you look at the map, um, it's the kind of middle of the three brownish colored countries. Today, it's made up of lots of different independent nations. Before World War I, though, it is a single blob that controls lots of different constituent parts, it is going to be right at the center of the First World War. And in many respects, it's representative of one of the other concepts that's going to be important to understand, um, which we'll talk about here in a moment. So the Triple Alliance formed in 1882, uh, Italy, Germany, and Austria-Hungary. Italy switches sides fairly early in the war, and the other quote-unquote enemy combatant of the war then, as far as the United States is concerned, is going to be the Ottoman Empire, which is basically today Turkey. The good guy, um, or good guys, rather, as far as the U.S. Is, is concerned, would be Britain, France, and Russia. That's the Triple Entente. So the U.S. is not directly involved in any of these alliances, any of these negotiations or arrangements. Certainly, in terms of sympathies, in terms of cultural connections, business connections, the United States definitely favors Britain and France in particular. Um, that being said, there are millions and millions of German Americans in the United States at the time of the war, too. So. Obviously, that has to be taken into consideration as well. But these different alliances, these agreements, were what were known as mutual defense pacts. Basically, what that means is if any of those countries uh, was attacked, not necessarily by a member of the other alliance, just if they were attacked at all, the other countries in that particular alliance would go to war to defend that country. So, in other words, if Germany would be attacked, whether it's attacked by France or whether it's attacked by, you know, Denmark. Denmark's not part of any of these alliances. The simple fact of Germany being attacked at all 
would trigger these arrangements and then Austria, Hungary, and Italy would be required to go to war in support, in defense of Germany. So the hope was that no country would dare attack any of these countries because it would trigger this negotiated alliance and everybody else would be drawn into the war, which ironically is exactly what happens. But in theory, it was intended to prevent a war from ever beginning because, you know, well, nobody would be stupid enough to attack any of these countries because you know what you're, what you're going to be bringing down on yourself. So these alliances were a big part of what's going on. There's also, and this might even be a more important issue, a question of nationalism. Nationalism exists in a couple of different ways. Um, nationalism on one hand is pride in your country, right? Patriotism. I believe that my country is the best in the world and it should do everything in its power to demonstrate that. Whether that is building a colonial empire, whether that is building a navy and an army that are the envy of the rest of the world, whether it is dominating the international economy, the global economy, right? One part of nationalism is wanting to demonstrate your country's superiority um, to all the other countries. So that's going to puff everybody up in Europe, especially Britain, France, Germany, Russia, Austria, right? Those in particular um, are really just kind of beating their chests, talking about how big and bad and important they are. The other side of nationalism is the issue of, <coughs> excuse me, ethnic groups, religious groups um, that are in some respects not in control of their own affairs. And this is again where Austria-Hungary really comes in. If you look at the map, um, you're probably going to have to expand it in, in sort of on your own time, but basically the map indicates in the Austria-Hungary area all the different kinds of ethnic groups and language groups and religious groups that are part of that big empire that don't have any direct say in the operation of the empire, right? So you've got Poles, you've got Ukrainians, you've got Romanians, you've got Austrians, you've got Hungarians, you've got Czechs, you've got Serbs and Slovaks, Bosnians, Italians, all these different groups of people are part of the Austria-Hungary Empire, right? Austro-Hungarian Empire. And yet none of them have their own country, with the exception, obviously, of the Austrians and the Hungarians. Uh, they have basically joint control over the empire. And so in this particular case, what this means is there's going to be groups of people inside the Austro-Hungarian Empire that want independence, that want freedom, that want sovereignty. It's known at the time as self-determination. And this is really the flashpoint where World War I kicks off. Um, in June 1914, the heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary, so the next in line, when his dad dies, he will become the emperor. Um, his name is Franz Ferdinand. He travels to Sarajevo on kind of a diplomatic peacekeeping mission. And he is personally fairly open to the idea of ethnic nationalism, right? In other words, he has the idea that maybe in an ideal situation, the Austrian Empire will grant some kind of self-control, self-determination, freedom to some of the different ethnic groups that live within its borders. And, sorry, there's a bit of kerfuffle with some of my cats. Um, so for Franz Ferdinand is traveling to Sarajevo, which is a city <clears throat> that is um, within the empire, within his empire, but it is basically populated by Serbs. So these are people who this is going to get kind of complicated. There is a Serbia, right? There is a Serbian country, but there are lots of Serbs who live in Austria 
who would like to break their part of Austria out of the empire to join Serbia, the country. Sarajevo is in the Austrian Empire. And he's traveling to Sarajevo on sort of a goodwill mission. And long story short, um, he is assassinated. He's murdered by a man named Gavrilo Princip. And Princip is part of this nationalist, terrorist, quasi-military organization called the Black Hand. And the Black Hand has basically a terrorist agenda of trying to slice that, that Serbian territory, that Slavic territory, off of the Austrian Empire and allow it to join up with Serbia, with the country of Serbia. So the assassination is bad enough. But what makes it even worse is it turns out pretty quickly that the Black Hand gets aid and assistance from the Serbian military, which basically makes this almost a level of state-sponsored assassination. This would be as though the U.S. Army um, supported an effort to assassinate the president of Mexico or something like that, right? It would be a huge, huge international incident. And in 1914, the assassination becomes a huge international incident. But there's nothing here that immediately points in the direction of, well, this is going to lead to World War I. Be because no country has been attacked, technically. Um, yes, Austria-Hungary is part of the Triple Alliance, along with Germany and Italy. But this is not an invasion, this is not a military action, and Serbia is certainly not part of any alliance. So on the face of it, this seems like a crisis, but not necessarily the thing that will lead to war. However, the actions of Germany, Austria, and Russia end up pushing things into actual war. On July 6th, so just little over a week after the assassination, Germany sends a message to Austria-Hungary saying, we got your back. Anything you need, we will do to support you in your efforts to um, kind of deal with Serbia. This is known as the blank check. The blank check is, is Germany giving almost complete unqualified support to Austria-Hungary. Austria-Hungary then they were already going to be powerful enough to um, push around Serbia, but having Germany at their back, Germany at this point has probably the most powerful army in Europe. Having Germany backing them up means that Austria can really push even harder. And so Austria then, a couple weeks after that, sends to Serbia what's called the July Ultimatum. And the July Ultimatum basically says, Serbia, we know that you're responsible for killing the Archduke. Um, you will let us occupy your country. You will let us root out the Black Hand, destroy it. We will basically run Serbia until we're satisfied that Serbia won't present us any additional threat. Well, this basically is completely undermining Serbia's independence, its sovereignty, and so naturally they refuse. But Serbia is a tiny little country, right? They wouldn't have been able to refuse and feel that they can actually stand up to Austria, let alone stand up to both Austria and Germany combined, if it hadn't been for the expression of support from someplace else. And that is Russia. Um, Russia is ethnically speaking, similar to the population of Serbia. And they had made announcements that they would sort of protect and preserve the independence and the sovereignty um, of Serbia and their Slavic, they used to call them their little brothers. So Russia, not terribly advanced in terms of military technology, not terribly well equipped, but lots and lots and lots of people. And so they are 
sort of a, a brute to be reckoned with when it comes to international affairs. And so Serbia says, well, you know, obviously we wouldn't be able to resist Austria, especially with Germany at its, at its side. But now that Russia is backing us up, we feel confident in basically giving the middle finger to this July ultimatum. So a few days after that, Austria declares war on Serbia. Again, not anything that would necessarily trigger any of these alliances, but because Germany is interested in positioning itself as a more powerful figure in Europe, because Russia is interested in proving to Europe that it is a force to be reckoned with, because of the reluctant involvement at this point of France and Britain, by early August, nearly all of Europe is at war. And a lot of that is driven by nationalism, one form or the other, and by these different alliances and, and promises of assistance and that kind of thing. <clears throat> at this point, though, the United States is not involved, right? The U.S. is neutral. The president at the time, Woodrow Wilson, is personally um, not interested in, in getting the country into the war. He believes that this is a, a recurring problem in Europe um, and that the United States needs to present a kind of um, moral guidance that can only be achieved by staying out of the war and offering um, to be a mediator, to be a, an intermediary, to say, hey, you know, if you want, we can step in and negotiate a settlement and that kind of thing. Um, the American public, <coughs> excuse me, very much in the same vein, did not want anything to do with the war. <coughs> this was something that was happening thousands of miles away. Um, among people who, from the American perspective at least, Europeans were constantly finding some reason or another to fight each other, and the U.S. didn't stand anything to gain. The Atlantic Ocean in 1914 did offer a great deal of protection. Um, today, you've got ballistic missiles, you've got jets, you've got powerful navies that can reach the coast of the United States in minutes or seconds or days. Um, in the case of 1914, it would have taken a couple weeks for any potential invasion or any potential naval attack um, to make its way to the American coast. And so the U.S. didn't really figure that there was any reason for us to get involved um, in the interest of self-defense because we were going to be defended anyway. That being said, most journalists, most of the American public, um, the American government certainly had a, at least a bit of bias towards the British and French. Um, part of this was cultural, part of this was economic, um, you know, any number of different factors. But officially, neutrality meant that we were supposed to be trading equally with everybody. That's not the way it panned out, but that was, at least on the face of it, um, the way neutrality was supposed to operate. There were Americans that volunteered for military units in the British Army, the French Army, the German Army, the Italian Army. Um, some of them ended up as pilots, some of them ended up as infantry, some ended up in the navies, um, but that was a fairly small number. And really the main way that the United States did get involved was through private relief efforts. And the most famous, the most significant, was the Commission for Relief in Belgium. It's technically that title, but it's more often referred to as Belgian Relief. It was led by a man named Herbert Hoover. Hoover will become important again in the 1920s. He's going to be president when the Great Depression starts in the United States. Um, Belgium had been devastated in the process of Germany's invasion of France. Um, Germany moves through Belgium on its way into France at the very, very beginning of the war. And even though there was no actual reason for them to do this, they end up um, pillaging and looting and 
basically destroying large parts of Belgium, leaving thousands and thousands of people homeless, leaving thousands and thousands of people dead or without food, without shelter, without medical support, um, any number of things. And so in the early years, the Americans are really trying to remain aloof, trying to remain separate. Um, Wilson, though, does have these kinds of moralistic ideas about what the war represents. He thinks that the United States can be a kind of a beacon for moral righteousness, that America is able to take a more enhanced role in world affairs, but he doesn't want it to be a military role. And so this creates this kind of almost schizophrenia in the United States as the war gets closer and closer because it's hard to really decide how the U.S. will officially fit within this whole um, circumstance, right? Okay, sorry about that. There was continuing issues between one of my kittens and one of my older cats, so... I needed to try to put a stop to that. Um, so certainly America's involvement in the war in Europe is limited largely to economic support or um, economic participation. And this was officially neutral in the sense that officially speaking, America was expected to trade equally with every country involved. Um, but in reality, the figures indicate a very clear preference between one side and the other. Partially, this was due to a British blockade of Germany, um, and partially it was due to other kinds of factors. But in the end, the figures there, I'm not going to read them out, the figures there indicate a very clear kind of change in the involvement of American businesses with the various powers involved in, in the war, right? Um, not only an increase in trade with the Allies, but a decrease in trade with what were known as the Central Powers. This ends up leading Germany to the um, opinion or, or the impression that one of the ways that they have to try to win this war is to blockade Great Britain. Um, Germany doesn't, they have a fairly powerful navy, but long story short, they're not really that active in the war effort. The part of the navy that is active in the war effort, though, is German submarines. And this is really the first time when submarines are used in large numbers in a deliberately strategic kind of a way. Submarines had been in existence all the way back to the American Revolution, but now they're beginning to be used intentionally as part of an overall um, war strategy. And basically what this is, is Germany completely unshackles its submarine fleet and says, go out and sink anything and everything that is carrying supplies that Britain might need. This is known as unrestricted submarine warfare. And this is um, a serious, serious problem for the British, and it will be one of the things that will ultimately draw the Americans into the war. Um, not in the ways that we might think, though, because um, there is an incident in 1915, shortly after the war begins, but still, actually, a couple years before the United States eventually gets involved, there is an incident where a German submarine sinks a passenger liner called the Lusitania. Um, in 1915, there was one way that you could get across the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean or any large body of water, and that was by boat, right? You couldn't fly. 
that's not going to happen for another 10 to 15 years, and even then it's expensive and unreliable and it takes multiple stops. So if you were traveling between, say, New York and London, or New York and Paris, or Boston, or wherever, um, you would have to take a ship. And the Lusitania was that kind of ship. So if you've heard of or watched the movie about the Titanic or anything like that, it's the same idea. In fact, the Lusitania was part of the um, Titanic's um, company. The Lusitania is not a warship. It is not a cargo ship that is carrying, um, you know, thousands and thousands of tons of material for Britain. It is a passenger liner that has almost 2,000 people on board who are traveling, in this case, from New York City to England. The Germans have made announcements saying, we're going to sink any ship that we think is carrying what was known as contraband, right? War material, stuff that shouldn't be on it. And we will, we used to announce our presence and give the crew and, and everybody time to leave the ship so that we just sank it and destroyed all of the materials. But anytime we did that, the people on the ship had a nasty habit of shooting at our submarines. And so from now on, we're just going to sink them, right? We're not going to provide any advanced warning except for making announcements in newspapers saying, generally speaking, um, do not sail as a passenger to Britain because we will make no distinctions if we believe that a ship is carrying anything that it shouldn't, we will sink it. So, May of 1915, the Lusitania is sunk right off the coast of Ireland, literally within sight of people on the coast of Ireland. And 1,200 people are killed, including um, more than 100 Americans. And that's not to say that that automatically makes this a tragedy, right? Oh, well, Americans die. Suddenly now this is a big deal. What that's meant to indicate, though, is that this instantly becomes a crisis of, of pretty significant proportions for the Wilson administration because he needs to figure out what to do, right? The United States is not at war. These are passengers on a peaceful ocean liner. The Germans say, yes, but the Lusitania was carrying ammunition and that immediately puts everybody's lives in forfeit and, and puts everybody's lives at risk. I'm not sure that that argument really holds a lot of water, but that's one of the things that the Germans were saying. Wilson then is confronted with, on the one hand, a public that is outraged and demands some kind of response from Germany, but by the same token, it's not a public that says, we should go to war with Germany over this. And Wilson certainly doesn't want to go to war with Germany over this. And so the agreement is reached for Germany to say, okay, we will pay reparations, right? We will pay um, money to the United States, to the families of the people who were killed, and we will agree to stop submarine warfare, right? We will not do this anymore. From the German point of view, they have to keep in mind that while submarine warfare is slowly squeezing Great Britain out of the war, by the same token, submarine warfare is the most likely way that the United States will get dragged into the war. And so they need to be very, very careful not to risk angering the United States to the point of the American government and the American people deciding, fine, screw it. If this is going to be the way it is, we will go to war, because that could seriously jeopardize Germany's chances at winning um, World War I. And so they make this calculated risk to say, well, as of right now, we think that it's better for us to let stuff trickle into Britain rather than 
risk sinking more and more and more ships, potentially angering the Americans more and more and more, and ultimately then possibly drawing the United States into the war. So it is a balancing act as far as the Germans are concerned. But it is one that they can't really keep going. Um, so the Lusitania is sunk in May of 1915. There's this brief flare-up of um, outrage and anger on the part of the United States, but that ultimate desire to stay out of the war um, supersedes any of that anger. By early 1917, though, Germany's situation has changed. Um, the war has been dragging on in France and Belgium now for two and a half years. Hundreds of thousands, millions of people are dying without any measurable change in anybody's positions on that side of the war, the Western Front. Germany is also fighting Russia in the east, and so they're stretched pretty thin. And so their decision is, we're going to resume submarine warfare, right? We're going to go back to this pretty much wanton destruction of any and every ship that is crossing the Atlantic, because in 1917, they revisit that calculation and they say, right now, we believe that we can knock Britain out of the war before the United States would have a chance to get involved. And so their decision now is, in 1915, keeping with submarine warfare was more of a threat, was more of a potential danger than getting rid of it. Now, getting rid of um, Britain by using submarine warfare is um, the more important goal. We can risk the possibility of the United States getting angry enough to declare war, because it's going to take them a while before they can actually make a difference. And by that time, hopefully, we have squeezed Great Britain out of the war once and for all, at which point the whole situation would change. So that's Germany's perception of, of circumstances. In March, the American public becomes aware of this really boneheaded message that is sent from um, the German government to the government of Mexico, promising the Mexican government that if Mexico attacks the United States, Germany will help Mexico reconquer the territory that Mexico lost in the Mexican-American War. Now, the Mexican-American War was in 1848, 1849, so, you know, not quite 70 years before this. Um, Germany obviously had no capacity whatsoever to get involved in a war between Mexico and the United States. Mexico was right smack in the middle of its own civil war and revolution, so it wasn't in any position to attack the United States. Even though there was sympathy among the Mexicans to do this, it wasn't practical at all for them to get involved. But when this information is revealed to the American public, Another outrage, and by this point, Germany is, is sinking additional American ships. Um, the Lusitania, I should say, was not an American ship. It had Americans on it, but increasingly Germany is sinking ships that are American ships. And the Zimmerman telegram. And Wilson feels that by this stage, his hand is, is kind of being forced. He feels by this point that America's best chance to exert its influence and moral authority is through actually going to war. And so he delivers a message to Congress asking for the United States to declare war, because again, Congress is the only part of the government that can actually declare war. Um, and April 6th, 1917, not quite three years into the war itself, the United States officially gets involved. And so that is going to be where we will pause here. Um, in our next session, then, we'll be talking about the experience of the war, the American involvement, and their contributions, 
and then the aftermath of the war. What happens in terms of international diplomacy, especially um, as far as the American involvement in the global arena? Does it actually come off the way that Wilson imagines it will, or is it different? Um, and so that's going to be our next session. So I hope everybody's doing really, really well. Make sure you let me know if you've got any questions that I can help with. Uh, make sure that you're looking over the full PowerPoints on Blackboard as well. And I will see everyone soon.